From the high desert and the great American Southwest, I bid you good evening, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you may be on the planet. This is Midnight in the Desert. I'm Art Bell. The rules for this program are short and sweet. No bad language. Mm-mm-mm-mm. No bad language. And only one call per show. That's it. Okay, a couple of items uh, before our guest tonight, Father uh, Jack Ashcraft. And here they are. Oh, no, wait a minute. I forgot all the thank yous, didn't I? I've got to do those. Thank you, Telos, for the great sound. Joe Talbot, of course, here in Pahrump. What are the odds of that? About a zillion to one. Keith Rowland, my webmaster. Heather Wade, producer. Stream guys. LV.net. Sales is Pete. Everheart, of course, and tune in radio for all that distribution. You know, it's easy. You get a telephone, an iPad, any kind of pad, just download, you know, the app, and, and you're here. You know, search for my name, and you're here. It's that simple. Now, Two women have apparently passed the uh, the Army's grueling ranger test, and even tougher and more dangerous jobs may well lie ahead. The military services are poised to allow women to serve in most front-line combat jobs. I don't think this is a good idea. I just don't. I, uh, I don't know why, uh, uh, because I'm old. <laughs> Officials say the Army uh, and Air Force, likely, will not seek exceptions, meaning they'll go along with it. Uh, Army, Navy, and Air Force are going to go. Not uh, not so much the Marines, though. They're, uh, They're going to seek an exception. I, I, I'm, I'm not, I'm a little puzzled actually why I'm against it. I, I think that in a combat situation, a, a military man would want to save a woman probably ahead of himself. Now, maybe they've somehow bred that out of them. I, I don't know. All right. There's a little bit of news. Public service announcements have indicated recently that if you see a UFO in England, forget it. Well, don't forget it. I mean, call MUFON. But the traditional people that have been uh, investigating UFOs in Great Britain are giving it up. Actually, uh, forget the RAAF uh, says, forget it. Don't even bother to report it to us. Mysterious Universe shares a trio of UFO sightings. This all comes from the anomalous.com. You might check them out. Uh, These defy conventional descriptions, which is impressive, given the fact that UFOs are already defying conventional description in the first place, right, by what they're doing. But uh, when's the last time you spotted a flying, glowing arrow? How about a flying, glowing arrow the size of an 18-wheeler over Long Island, New York? According to eyewitnesses, not one but many, who caught it on video, the UFO approached Long Island, MacArthur Airport, blinking lights, then stopped in midair, and then, get this, began moving backwards. Now, that is not generally something airplanes can do normally or ever. And a bit south... um, I guess they've discovered uh, several sightings of UFOs near a place called Uxmal. I believe it is U-X-M-A-L in uh, uh, Mexico. But you know what? There have been so many of them that like in in close encounters of the third kind people, visitors are frequently seen gathering nightly and waiting for the UFOs to show up. One last housekeeping item, and then we're off and away. And that is, 
I have said on my Facebook page, and now I'm going to say here on the air, we have something called time travelers. Time travelers are people who join us for, at the moment, five bucks a month. Time travelers are able to listen to any old show, any, you know, tomorrow morning. You could be listening to this program. Many of you, I'm sure, are. And uh, so it gives you the, the ability to do that, to listen to older shows um, as we have created them. And now we're beginning to get a little pile of old shows, or a pretty good-sized pile, actually. So you have that privilege, and you also have the ability to go, as a matter of fact, let me bring it up right now. I got busy before the show. We have something um, called the wormhole, and that gives you the ability to go to artbell.com, type in a question. That suddenly appears on my computer, and then I can pass it on to the guest, or not, depending on the quality of your question, frankly. All right, comes now Father Jack Ashcraft. He was ordained a traditional Byzantine Catholic priest in 2005 and a Sedeve uh, contest. That's a Sedeve contest, I believe. Uh, and as such, he is a very vocal critic of the Vatican, as was Father Martin exposing the infiltration of the Vatican by forces in contention with Christianity who support globalism. He is an independent author addressing apologetics issues like modern modern cultural changes, the paranormal phenomena, exorcisms, UFOs, and more. He's been called, in fact, the Malachi Martin of the 21st century. He is one of the leading authorities on cults, the occult, and exorcism. So coming up in just a moment is going to be a very, very interesting man. Father Ashcraft. And oh, I've got lots of places to go with this program tonight. Stay right where you are. And where you are is Midnight in the Desert. I'm Art Bell. And any sun. Will you partake of that last offered cup or disappear into the potter's ground? Want to take a ride? Your conductor, Art Bell, will punch your ticket when you call 1 952 Call Art. That's 1 952 225 5278. Seemed the uh, perfect opening bumper, wouldn't you say? <laughs> All right, now, um, one one last thing that I guess I didn't mention. Uh, we have a deadline for the uh, time travelers I mentioned. Yes, indeed. It's $5 right now, and you'll be grandfathered in if you join between now and tomorrow night midnight. That's the deal. Between now and tomorrow night midnight. No. Let's see, what is today? Today is the 18th. Midnight on the 20th. Okay, midnight on the 19th, depending on how you want to think of it. I guess it's midnight on the 20th. Get all fouled up with midnight. All right. Uh, anyway, here he comes. Father Jack Ashcraft, welcome to uh, Midnight in the Desert. It's an honor and a privilege. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Uh, where are you located out of curiosity? I'm actually in the greater Cincinnati, northern Kentucky area. Okay. All right. Um Father, you also knew of Father Malachi Martin. Many have you apparently compared you to him. Is that correct? Yeah, but I, I you know, I'm glad you asked that because I want to sort of clear something up on that. Okay. <laughs> um, it is certainly not because I have the the same um, level of education as Father Martin. As you know, he was highly educated. And uh, a brilliant man, very intelligent. Um, well, you've obviously, re- you've obviously got some under your belt. Well, yeah, but <laughs> <laughs> not quite to the, the degree he had. Um, I think really the comparison is really because he and I approach the same topics in a very public and vocal manner uh, that uh, perhaps others might not. Well, then it would be appropriate for you to pick up the mantle. Um, 
You say you're a sede vacantis. What is that, please? Well, the term sede vacantis comes from the Latin sede vacante, which means the seat is vacant. Now, whenever a pope dies, the church is in a state of sede vacante. Um, however, the uh, the position of sede vacantis, which is the position that Father Martin came to later in his life, is that the popes from the start of um, the pontificate of John the 23rd on down to the current claimant to the papacy are all anti-popes. That is, they are not real popes. Wow. They are false wow. shepherds wow. and uh, not to be trusted. And Father Martin came to that uh, position himself late in life and uh, that is uh, really the connection I have to this through. Okay, we're getting a sudden a bunch of noise in there. Maybe it's a cord on your... I'm sorry. That's all right. Um, uh, so he came to the same conclusion late in life, you say? Yeah, and uh, he, he actually participated in the ordination of at least one Sedevicontus priest, um, for the uh, Roman Rite rather than the Byzantine, um, which makes sense because Father Martin was uh, Roman Rite. Yes. He um, he even went further, um, and I'm going to come back to this, but uh, he even went further in saying that there was evil influence uh, in the Vatican. Oh, absolutely. I mean, oh, from you the agree. time... I mean, John the 23rd, um, there were documents that um, fell into the hands of some Sede Vicantis that uh, proved that John the 23rd had been a Rosicrucian and possibly even a Freemason. And from there, I mean, you, you have a whole lot of other things that connected to that. Um, a lot of the other prelates had connections to at the time, Soviet Russia were um, closet communists. Wow. Um, and uh, then you had others who were outright occultists and Satanists, as Father Martin made very clear. You sure did. Um, and so you agree with that? Well, absolutely. How there, come? There's... How come you don't get a, a letter from Rome saying you're out? <laughs> well, Rome doesn't recognize any state of a contest, so. <laughs> but but the point is is that because we understand that they are that that the current hierarchy is not valid, they don't have any authority to over us anyway. So uh, even if they did issue a letter, it would be meaningless uh, because according to traditional canon law, um, we are quite valid. And in fact, at this point, are the only valid clergy um, that the Catholic faith will have. So much like, uh, I don't know, um, civil service workers, you can't be fired. Correct. Correct. Yeah, there's, I mean, they can't do anything. They can complain, as they did with uh, Archbishop Lefebvre and the Society of St. Pius X, but... Uh, Ultimately, that's not going to do them any good. They have no authority. Okay. Um, yeah, and you, you know that it's interesting um, that uh, people are aware of Father Martin's uh, writings on these issues, but they're not really that aware of how it is he knew so much. And I think that is a very interesting story and a lot of the I, I guess you could call them fans of Father Martin take umbrage when the information is is given uh, because it's not pretty he but, did he did know a great deal and uh, probably shared more with me than he should have um, things that I don't share on the air uh -huh. uh, and some that I do uh, but yes you're right he knew a very great deal I guess he was close to popes, and um, I can only imagine in my mind what it would take uh, for somebody like yourself or Father Martin or any other priest to 
get to the point where you're saying the things that you're saying, it must be really bad. Well, yes, and it has been since uh, the, uh, the 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 at least pretend pontificate of John the Twenty Third, oh. and and uh, Father Martin. What a lot of people don't realize is that he knew because in his very early years in the sixties and early seventies, he worked for one of the architects of the subversion oh. and realized at some point, obviously, that he had worked for the wrong side. In and with the wrong was, crowd, yeah. That was Cardinal Bay. Wow. Um of course, like I said, some of the fans of Father Martin get upset when you mention that fact, but it is nonetheless a fact. Uh, Father Martin wrote under various pen names, um, books and articles in support of the subversive, uh, the subversive element that was present at the Second Vatican Council. Mm -hmm. And he was on that payroll. And uh, at some point in his life, he clearly came to the uh, realization that whoa I'm on the wrong side here and um, he switched sides pretty quickly so uh, his information wasn't just because he was a Jesuit and worked with popes it was because he actively worked with the very subversive forces that he later in his life worked to combat realizing what he uh, the, the mistake he had made I think do you have you heard anything about how his life ended? Yeah, there's a lot of rumor there. I know. Um, you know, there's some. There were apparently some very uh, shady characters around him, um, and I do know that uh, from what I've I've heard. This this is just rumor. I don't know for sure, but he was getting ready to, uh, along with another priest expose a particular individual um, uh, who was a uh, I believe a, a bishop and uh, and then he met his unfortunate and sudden demise it was uh, suspicious to say the least wow you are adding to what I had heard um, I heard that uh, the fall itself down the steps was suspicious. Mm -hmm. Now, what you have added is a possible motive for it. Yeah. Goodness. Yeah. Um, all right, so how's it going with you? Uh, hopefully you don't have any steep staircases close by. <laughs> Fortunately, I live on a one level. Um, <laughs> Good for you. <laughs> but uh, I, I do have enemies, and most of them are are just uh, on online uh People who like to uh, attack me, claiming I'm a Jesuit plant when I've never been a Jesuit in my life. Right. Um, <laughs> okay. uh, I had a group of occultists who attempted a, uh, a smear campaign against me at one point, and uh, you know the the usual um, hyper fundamentalist crowd who uh, attack you with you know, whatever they can make things up. It's, I assume this is mainly because of your public stance. Yes, exactly. Okay. Um, you know, when you, when you, as you know, when you're in the public eye, um, especially on the Internet, it's anything goes. It's a mm. free-for-all. <laughs> oh, how well I know. How well I know. All right. Um, let me begin by asking this really important question. Is Satan real? Absolutely. I do believe in a very real, literal Satan, um, just as I believe in a literal, real, historical Adam. Um, I don't know what Father Martin's position on that was. Oh, uh, um, he was with you all the way. Okay. <laughs> a very real Satan. In fact, uh, he once made a comment, uh, Father, that he would walk down the streets in New York City, and uh, he would see people, and somehow he would know instinctively or in a way that only he could know that he was looking at uh, what he called a perfectly possessed person. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You ever hear that phrase? Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah, I mean, um, anyone who's involved in exorcism ministry for any length of time... And, and I want to stress that that is just a, a small 
aspect of an overall sacerdotal ministry. Um, but anyone who's been involved with it for any length of time develops a, a discernment um, and is able to recognize the signs of possession. And uh, uh, there are some who propose a perfect possession, um, which means that the the demonic entity is in full and complete control 24 hours, seven days a week. Yes. And that uh, the personality of the host is um, subdued and uh, is no longer in control of the faculties. He seemed to feel that it, it more or less meant that the individual involved had made their deal. Whether it was for, um, you, you know, work, it was for fortune, it was for lust, yeah. or whatever the deal was. They had made their deal. Uh, they're either satisfied with it or it doesn't matter because they've been taken over at that point. Yeah, yeah. A perfect possession is, is only possible when the person voluntarily gives themselves over to this, um, in exchange for money, fame, whatever it might be, as you said. Um, those cases are rare, but um, I think that demonic activity is becoming more prevalent. Did we lose your audio? I'm not hearing you now. That's not good. Um, hello, Father. Okay, well, my, fa- my guest is uh, Father... Ashcraft, and uh, we apparently have lost connection with him. Yes, I see there's a little thing that says, there is a problem with this call. Uh, Hold on until we can reestablish the call. So I'm sure that's what it's trying to do right now. Um, We were discussing people who are perfectly possessed, and I think you're back now. Yes. I'm not sure what happened. I could hear you the whole time. It just wasn't allowing me to speak. I see. Um, but uh, demonic activity is becoming more uh, common, and and I think it's because our our society and our culture is moving more and more away from uh, godly principles, away from morality, away from any sense of ethics, uh, any objective values whatsoever, into this postmodern milieu um, of absolute relativism. Right. Um, he said that the number of um, people possessed or in trouble in New York City was had risen by some astronomical number. Now, this is years ago, and he said it was increased by 800%, which I found incredible. Mm-hmm. I, I yeah. don't know how he gets those numbers, but... I, I, I couldn't tell you. I don't know. I just know that we see more cases... Now, um, however, I still want to say that, you know, the, the number of claims compared to the number of actual cases is still, uh, there's a wide margin there. The number of claims that I receive in a year uh, is just astronomical, but once they're investigated, generally you find that there's something else going on here. Uh-huh. Anything ranging from, um, psychological issues all the way down to just absolute fakery and attention seeking. Sure. I'm sure there's a lot of that. I mean, in all areas uh, that we examine on this program, we get a lot of that. You know, there's a yeah. lot of fakery. It's hard to sift through it all. However, it's very important to sift through it all. As a good friend of mine who does a show after mine called Richard C. Hoagland says, uh, all it takes is one uh, white crow to prove there are white crows. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if, if there's only one case of demonic possession in, uh, my entire lifetime, then, uh, that's one too many, in my opinion. Um, are there degrees of possession? Yes. Well, not, not necessarily possession, but demonic activity, influence over the individual, um, everything starting, starting from, uh, diabolic temptation. In other words, a temptation to do things that goes beyond normal temptations, um, that becomes, uh, consuming. Um, hmm. something you just can't avoid, uh, anymore. It's in your every thought. Um, and. 
like drugs, alcohol, women. Yes, any of those things. <laughs> all uh, those, they, yes. Those are all um, hooks, uh, enticements to deeper uh, demonic influence. Um, and, and that generally leads to obsession. You know, you're obsessed with a particular level or area of uh, sinful activity, self-destructive activity. Huh. Um, and uh, the next step um, beyond that, um, well, would be oppression first, I would say. Oppression is first. Uh, precedes obsession. Oppression is, um, the, the best way to think about that is you've read the, the story of Job and how Job was attacked in sacred scripture and uh, Satan took away everything from him, his children, his wife, yes, his family, yes, yes. you know, everything. Yes. Um, that is a, an, a biblical example of oppression. Now, in the uh, current world... Um, Father, hold your, hold your thought. Uh, we're, sure. at a, we're at a break, so hold tight. Exclusively on the Dark Matter Digital Network, this is Midnight in the Desert with your host, Art Bell. To call Art, please dial 1-952-225-5278. That's 1-952-CALL-ART. Actually, please don't call yet, actually. That's two actuallys, isn't it? (laughs) Just wait. Uh, We'll get uh, deeper into the interview, and then we will indeed open the phone lines, not to worry. Once again, Father... uh, Ashcraft, and uh, great to have you back, and great to have you on the show. I think we had just uh, discussed Job a little bit, and I don't think you were done, so proceed. Yeah, we were, were talking about oppression, and um, the fact that uh, that is one of the levels of demonic activity, and that would work out in modern life in much the same way it did for Job. Um, you experienced, uh, you might experience your, your a loss of job, a loss of livelihood. You lose your uh, your wife. She leaves you. You know things like this. It just mm-hmm. overwhelming and persistent problems surrounding your life um, could be indications of demonic oppression. And then the final, the end game is actual possession, and uh, demonic possession can um, either be transient. Or perfect, as we've discussed. And in transient possession, that is the most common. The demonic entity um, enters and leaves the body intermittently um, in order to uh, carry out its uh, uh, its desires, whatever that might be. Um, Father, can I ask um, an opinion question? And that is, how many people do you think are in... Um various types of asylums who have been judged by somebody in a position to do so that they are crazy, they are mentally disturbed, but they're actually in, they're possessed? Um, I think it's it's not unreasonable to say that there is a, a good portion of people who are in psychiatric facilities um, who are under some form of demonic wow. um, attack. Uh, that's not to say all of them, because, I mean, there are many things that can masquerade as uh, or, or be mistaken for demonic activity that are actually uh, psychological or environmental. Um, you know, things like temporal lobe epilepsy, Geschwind syndrome, sure. bipolar manic depression, etc., um, sure, and, sure, but a doctor, so, a psychiatrist, is almost never going to diagnose demonic possession. Well, true enough, but there are there are a growing number of psychologists who have recognized the um, the spiritual dimension to some of the uh, 
approaches to psychotherapy and that in some cases um, exorcism has ended what they perceived to have been a purely psychological issue. Uh, I wonder when they write up the final report if they really include the fact that uh, whatever cure or improvement was achieved was because of exorcism. There have been a couple. I do know of a couple. I I can't remember the the specific um, psychiatrist names off the top of my head. I was reading the report the other day. One of the reports is available at my website, um, and there's also a link there to uh, another website on the uh, right-hand side there that will take you to another article by the other um, psychiatrist. So <laughs> they're both there for people who are interested in reading them. They're pretty lengthy, um, very clinical, but they do explain the role of exorcism in psychotherapy. Yeah, I would think, I, w- I would think generally, um, kind of like again, uh, close encounters of the third kind with the, uh, air controller <laughs> asking the pilot, do you want to report a UFO? And the pilot thought about it for months and said, no, I don't want to report one of those. <laughs> it's kind of like that. Yeah. Um, all right. I, I've i got to get this out, so let me get it out. Uh, the other day, I interviewed um, a leader of the Church of Satan. Mm-hmm. This uh, woman, articulate, very well-spoken, obviously well-educated, says that she was, uh, some time ago, the high priestess of the Church of Satan. She was Anton LaVey's lover. Uh, she is the mother of his son. And she presently is the chairmistress of the Council of Nine. Now, when we booked that interview, I thought, oh, God, you know, this is going to be some really scary stuff. I mean, we're talking chains rattling, hellfires burning, that sort of thing. Uh, the interview turned out to be anything but that. And, uh, in fact, I asked, I think the first question I asked it was, do you, so you worship Satan? She said, no. I paused thought about it for a moment. I thought, well, now, wait a minute. Here you are, head of the church, Church of Satan, and you don't worship Satan. Well, okay, so that that's... And what I'm going to do is I'm going to let you hear just a moment of that interview, and then I'll come back and, uh, and get your impressions of it. Um, this was the most easygoing, uh attempting to be likable Satanist that you're ever going to hear in your whole life. Well, let me play this, and then we'll talk more. But again, I'm, I'm going to keep going down this road as, as far as I can take you. Uh, and I will ask, uh, is it possible to use a person's essence, how, uh, bodily fluids, whatever, essence, uh, in, in a positive way for them? Uh, as well as a negative way for them. Absolutely. We have three basic rituals. We have lust, compassion, and destruction. So the point of going into the ritual chamber in the first place is not primarily to move the universe in the way you want it to. I mean, that's, that's of course good as, as a side effect, but it's a, it's a psychodrama. Let me give you an example. Sure. Okay? So someone at work is really working against you. Uh, someone is telling the boss lies about you. They're, they're making you look bad. They're hiding your materials. They're really going out of their way to hurt you. Yes. So you go into the, you're really frustrated. You're thinking about this person all the time. You can't eat. You can't sleep. You're really angry mm-hmm. and you feel impotent. So you go into the ritual chamber. You do a destruction ritual. You concentrate on this person and you wish them all the bad, bad things to happen to them and you let it go. You let all of it go. You build up all of that energy and like a good orgasm, you just flow out. Mm. It goes out into the universe and then you let go of the rope. It's done. 
As far as you're as far as you're concerned, it is done. It's a done deal. As far as you're, you're concerned. You've spoken to the universe. It's going to happen. Whatever's supposed to happen will happen. So next week, you go into work, and this schmo has been promoted and moved to Hawaii. So did your curse work? Well, you don't have to deal with him anymore, do you? So, and maybe he'll get caught in a wonderful storm in Hawaii, and maybe his life will be So maybe you go in next terrible. week, and he was hit by a Mack truck, now has about 35 broken bones, and is in traction in the hospital. There you go. You know, that's, that's <laughs> the way it goes. Yes. Um, well, I, I love the fact that you can bring up the, the, the rosiest metaphor possible when discussing somebody you don't like. <laughs> so that's the way the interview went, Father. And it, it at the end of the interview, people were saying, oh, my goodness, um, that really was something. Uh, there, there was nothing scary about that. In fact, sounded kind of good. And, you know, I thought, Boy, I didn't have a good show, did I? And so the next day, I did something I never do. I listened to my own program again. And it hit me like a brick about three quarters of the way through it. That um, Satan is a trickster. And so it would make sense that the head of the church, the representative of the of Satan would be the very same, and boy, that is exactly what she was. And then, as I listened to the show, I really began to get creeped out, because she was so well-spoken for the bad guy. Well, you know, as you mentioned, um, Satan is a trickster, and he will come as an angel of light. Yeah. And and scripture says he will do that uh, so that he can deceive the very elect. Um, you know, the, the fact of the matter is sin, evil, feels good. Otherwise, nobody would do it. I mean, that's just how it is. You are, you are dead on the money. And I, it just, it. when I was doing the show, you know, I was looking for a scary show. What I got was a scary show. It just didn't hit me until the next day. And I went, oh, yeah. my God, what what did I do? I, I wasn't paying attention. Yeah, and I, and I think a lot of people are, are not looking beyond her, uh, the fluff in what she had to say. That's right. Uh, to the philosophy that lies underneath it, um, which is definitely a malevolent approach to humanity, yes. um, just on a purely anthropological level, <laughs> um, not even to speak of the spiritual level there. Uh, you know, with, with Satanism, you have two distinct schools there. You know, the Levee type tend to look at it uh, from a sort of psycho-spiritual perspective, right. which is what you had from this woman. And then you have people like uh, Michael Aquino, uh-huh. who recognizes the literal uh, Satan and sets out to uh, worship and embody the character of the literal biblical Satan. And uh, you've just got flip sides of the same coin there. One's just a little bit more honest about what they're worshiping than the other. <laughs> same end person, though, huh? Or Indeed so. <laughs> entity, I guess, is the right word. Um, as an exorcist, I would guess that you have, in effect, encountered Satan. Um, not him himself. Um And that, I would say, is pretty rare. I only know of a few cases where uh, the entity claimed to have been Satan himself. Um, And and even in in those cases, you have to take that with a grain of salt. Theologically speaking, um, we we tend to think that uh, Satan doesn't personally possess anyone, uh, although... Um, there is some speculation that he will in the person of the Antichrist. Um, rather, what we find in cases of demonic possession are um, the fallen angels who followed Satan and became demons. They are the ones carrying out this work. 
And they do so essentially because they envy and hate humanity at the same time. Um, we That's have interesting. things envy, that they no. don't. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Right. Let me stop you there, and let's talk about that. Envy and hate. They envy us. Why? Well, we possess something that angels don't. That is a soul. And we were also created, as Scripture says, in the image and likeness of God. Angels were not. And because we have such an intimate connection like that to the Creator, Mm -hmm. uh, Satan and these angels who followed him, Scripture says it was a third, uh, they grew angry. They hated us because they felt, because they were so magnificent that they should be the rulers and they should be the beloved of the Creator. And uh, yet they weren't. Um, Satan himself, Scripture tells us, was created um, with uh, the essence of music in his being. Hmm. And uh, that he was a, a an angel of light. And... Uh, you know, a very beautiful angel. Um, and so this, uh, the envy that must just rack his being at the fact that humanity was created in the image and likeness of God and he wasn't and he feels that he is more powerful, he is more beautiful, he should be more beloved. But that's not the case. And so that's where you get this envy and hatred of humanity. And that's why the demons attack humans. They want to, in whatever way they can, mar, destroy uh, the image of God in man. That's what that war is about. Wow. Um, All right. I know this is a really dumb question to ask a priest. But um, one that uh, I'm going to ask anyway, you are absolutely convinced beyond any shadow of a doubt that we have souls. Yes. Yes. Um, and that's, of course, because I approach this from a place of faith. Although there, there are some, um, some out there in the... Uh, I, I guess you would say scientific community who right. approach approach the subject of metaphysics and try to prove things scientifically. I don't really need that um, because I, I tend to take a uh, a biblical approach, a biblical worldview, and and so for me, um, when Scripture says this is so, then I accept that is so. On I faith. so envy you for that. Absolute knowledge that you have. I so envy that. I really do. I want to believe. Now, <laughs> conversely, strangely, perhaps, uh, and this will turn into a question. You know, I have cats. People have dogs, cats, various animals. But when I look into their eyes and when I watch their behavior and I, I see these cats have love, they have, um, just about every emotion that one can have without the ability to express it vocally. Uh, in other words, they have everything that would make me believe that if there are souls, if we have them, that they do too. Um, I'm not going to get you in trouble here, am I? <laughs> by, by asking, I mean, do they have souls? <laughs> um, you know, you're, you're asking a question that uh, you, you could ask a number of theologians and get different answers. <laughs> Let's be honest. But, okay. Um, that sounds a little like mention, a wiggle, but okay. Scripture does mention um, uh, animals being in the uh, the uh, eternal kingdom, the kingdom of God, um, after the uh, you know the the final battle, as everybody knows, at Armageddon. Um, you know, it talks about the lion lying down with the lamb. Uh, so. You know, will they have, do they have souls? I, I can't answer that positively. That's something that I think, um, scripture is fairly silent on as far as addressing particularly. Um, okay, I have it's very, very clear about human beings, but, uh, but animals not so much. Yeah. And, and, uh, you know, 
I, you know, just speaking from opinion here, I would say no, but that doesn't preclude them from uh, being in the kingdom. Obviously, they're going to be there. Uh, scripture has that imagery. Um, but uh, you're right, they are capable of um, a certain degree of emotion. I see it. I see it all. I mean, I, we could tick through the emotions. We don't need to. I mean, love, envy, um, just every every sadness, um, happiness, joy. I you could just go right on through them, except for the ability to vocalize these things. Uh, they, they've got them all. And mm-hmm. well, I don't know. Um, being such an animal, I'm. I'm very big animal lover, and when you look into their eyes, it feels like you're looking at as much life as when you're looking at a person. Um, so I don't know. Well, you know, I, there are those who would argue that uh, those emotions are the effect of a soul, and um, yeah. so. Well, yeah, exactly. All right, we're at a break point. It's a good one too. Um, Father, hold on. Father Ashcraft is my guest. And um, I knew he was going to be good, and he's good. We haven't even begun to talk about what you do about possession. Of course, I'm talking about exorcism. Stay right where you are, because it's ahead. next to cast your ray of light into the darkness please call 1952 call art that's 1952-225-5278 it's uh, in some cases radio actually welcome back i'm art bell this is midnight in the desert father uh, jack ashcraft is my guest and um knew this would be a good show i just knew it would be and it is um all right father um you mentioned uh, Armageddon, and you mentioned that you thought the influence of Satan was increasing, as did uh, Father Martin. I wonder if, if <laughs> that final day that nobody knows when it will be, uh, Armageddon itself, simply occurs when his influence uh, becomes predominant, when it uh, when it takes over, and then that's it. Well, certainly uh, a study of eschatology will tell us that, uh, you know, society uh, throughout the world will grow increasingly um, godless, immoral. And uh, uh, whether knowingly or not, um, everyone, every single person in this world is involved in spiritual warfare, whether they know it or not. Um and, and so, you know, depending on your position in that war, in that battle, depends on uh, <laughs> what side you're going to be fighting for, knowingly or unknowingly, um, and what the end result will be for you personally. But certainly, the uh, scripture tells us that the culture throughout the world will become increasingly um, godless, malevolent, and uh, I think we see that today. You know, when you um, look at ISIS, look what they're doing. Uh, I mean, even within their own stated belief systems, uh, what they're doing is all whacked out and wrong, lopping off heads, doing the very worst things to people you can imagine, doing, lighting them on fire. Oh, God, it's awful. Absolutely well, awful. Yeah, yeah. And, and what you have there is you have a people who are calling evil good yes. and good evil. Yes. And, uh, you know, they justify everything from uh, rape and murder to theft. It's, right. I mean, pedophilia. Right. All of this is somehow in this twisted worldview that they have somehow uh, a godly thing. And this is, this is what Scripture tells us is going to occur in the world. And, you know... 
I'm going to be politically incorrect here. Oh, be my um, guest. <laughs> uh, coming from the uh, biblical worldview, then I also have to say that uh, the homosexual agenda, um, which goes far beyond asking for mere rights, it, to, to in some cases forced participation in the lifestyle to one degree or another, um, that is indicative of what Scripture tells us would happen. Um, and conversely, let's point the finger at the church as well. Churches not doing what they should do. In my opinion, no one should go hungry or homeless who lives within five, ten miles of a church. Now, if you think about uh, how many churches we have in just the United States, we wouldn't need a welfare state if the church would simply uh, fulfill Christ's command to love our neighbor as ourselves, feed them, clothe them. Well, the church uh, from the Vatican on down certainly has plenty of money, don't they? Well, yeah, the institutional churches certainly do. And, um, you know, I think that also contributes to the problem. I think uh, this current pope is indicative of the problem in Western culture in general. Um, he is he is not, obviously not, <laughs> a uh, traditional Catholic in any sense of the term. He is not a biblical Christian in any sense of the term. The man is at best a post-modernist. I know he's been shocking the Catholic world. I mean, really shocking it. My wife, by the way, Father, is Catholic. She's uh, a Filipina, mm-hmm. uh, and they're very Catholic. Yes. I mean, really Catholic. Uh, and um, uh, several things the Pope has said um, have, for her, been very shocking, and I, I guess for a, a lot of Catholics. Well, certainly, but... Is this... Uh, I don't know how to put this. Uh, is it... Is it the church itself uh, just becoming, uh, starting to become politically correct? What's going on? Oh, well, what's going on indeed? We lost Father Ashcraft. That's right. He'll be back. Um, Stipe is attempting to reconnect. This is really something that has puzzled me. I'm, I, by no stretch of the imagination, am I a, um, a Catholic. I, I sort of looked at it, as you all know. I, I, hi, Father, you're back. Um, I'm certainly not a conservative Catholic, and I'm barely a Catholic, if one at all. My wife is. Now, what is the church doing, Father? Are they, are they becoming politically correct? I mean, what's going on in the church? Well, again, this goes back to the Second Vatican Council. Um, there was a document released <clears throat> that was uh, published under the title um, AA1025, The Memoirs of an Anti-Apostle. And it was the account of a uh, of a nun who was also a nurse um, who was tending a dying priest. And um, he proceeded to tell her his, uh, his past and what he had done. And what what came out of this um, out of his story was that he was a, a one of a number of of men who were uh, actually uh, Soviet um, I guess you could call infiltrators who um, their job was to enter the seminaries uh, become priests and move up through the ranks and to uh, destroy the social teaching of the church by first attacking the theology of the church. Hmm. And they were, they were joined in this by a number of Freemasons. Um, and, uh, as a matter of fact, there were a lot of Freemasonic observers at the Second Vatican Council as well. So, and, if you know anything about uh, church history, the, the Masonic Lodge has historically been a, a self-avowed enemy of the uh, Catholic faith. Um, and uh, and so 
what emerged from this this man's uh, this priest's story was uh, that he, along with a number of other men, uh, had infiltrated seminaries, had arisen through the ranks, and that they were the ones responsible for the destruction wrought at the Second Vatican Council, huh. which is which is really the root of the rot that we see today. And so, really, what you see in Bergoglio. Uh, otherwise known as Francis the First, mm. what you see in Bergoglio is the fruit of that revolution at the Second Vatican Council, and what he is talking is patented uh, social Marxism. But okay, but here's a point of confusion for me: uh, doesn't the Church? have values that could be said to be uh, somewhat uh, akin to uh, communist uh, values. Uh, We all know communism doesn't work, but um, in terms of taking care of everybody, right? There there are certain values that one could imagine are shared. Well, certainly, certainly. Um, But the, the problem is that um, from the purview of Marxism, that means taking from everyone so that everyone essentially is equally poor. Right. <laughs> and eventually, uh, when, when you, when you enforce that through government, what happens is eventually there's, there's no wealth to share. That's right. Uh, of course, that's correct. I mean, it doesn't work, but. Right, right. Um, and, and so the church, uh, Christianity is not against wealth per se, uh, but the love of wealth, the love of money. Um, and, and there have been um, some political ideologies to emerge from traditional Catholic teaching um, to um, sort of bridge that, uh, that, that gap. And one of those is distributism. And uh, I I can't speak on that topic, uh, really. I can't speak to it very well because I I don't know it well enough to do so. Um, but I, I you know it, it's a fascinating topic, and it and it essentially says that uh, the best way to help everyone is to you know the to place property into the hands of as many people as possible. Hmm. Um, and uh, so it's it's. I guess distributism sort of gets close to socialism. It does. It does. <laughs> but but it avoids the extremes of uh, Marxism. I know the love of money is a problem. Um, and, you know, I'm doing okay. I've got money. But it has never been the driving force. In fact, I really don't care about it. As long as I have enough to live and eat and my family's okay, that's good enough for me. I think there there is a difference, isn't there? I mean, if you're doing what you're doing with the sole goal being enriching yourself, then it's the love of money. Uh, oh, certainly, if, certainly. If money just comes to you as a side benefit of what you're doing, I hope it's not the same thing. <laughs> right. I mean, uh, as you said, uh, I mean, we'll, we'll take you as an example. Yes. Um, sure. You don't need to be doing this radio program. Not at all. I mean, no. I mean no. uh, th- th- there's nothing uh, financial in it for you. No. Well, you, no, I'm there sure is. you have a comfortable life at this I do. point. I do. You're absolutely right. I'm doing this only for the love of radio. Now, exactly. I, hope, I hope that's not a sin. <laughs> no, not at all. And and the thing is that um, because you do it, because you love it, you enjoy it, um, that comes through, and and the product is is better, I think, than if it was merely done with a a view to generating money. Money. I surely hope that's true. Yes, and it is. I mean, it's true of me. I just hope that it's true. I mean, if money comes to you anyway, I hope it doesn't doom you. <laughs> well, unfortunately, it's not true of, of many uh, in the ministry. I mean, um, televangelists for a lot of, I mean, come on, there's oh, yeah. all the evidence we need. Oh, you're right about that. Uh, boy, if I... You actually, you, actually, you actually had one on your show once that... Uh, <laughs> I'm sure I have. So, I've had, had just about everybody, so... Yeah, this, this particular individual's... Uh, Quite, uh, he and I have clashed. I, I know uh-huh. him on a personal level, and I, I happen to know the man is—he's uh, driven by money. 
and and that's a shame. Huh. Uh, you would think that that would be so. Well, maybe not so obvious um, to the individual named. I, let's not name him. All no, right, I'm not. Let's let's move on a little bit. Um, I do want to talk about exorcism. Uh, you know, people have an image of exorcism, which most likely, almost certainly, has been formed by movies, I would say, right? Yes. Is it like the movies? Absolutely not. Thought, um, thought not. You know, you, you're not going to see heads spinning and the, you know, the pea soup type thing. Um, you know, it, you can see demonstrative um uh, outbursts, and you can sometimes witness objects moving, uh, strange things uh, such as uh, words forming underneath the skin Ooh. of uh, the possessed. You, um, have you seen that? I haven't personally seen that. No, I have heard um, several different voices emerge at the same time. Oh, oh um, at the same time? Yes. Oh yes. my. Um, where you would hear uh, two or three different voices speaking at once, saying different things. Um, and I witnessed objects move, um, but but I've not witnessed uh, you know the skin issue. Though there are priests who have, uh, and I All do right. know some of them. This is going to sound strange to you, but I hope that what you're saying about possession is absolutely true. And the reason I hope it's true is because if it is, and if Satan is real, then God is real. And that's one of the reasons, by the way, I interviewed the Satanist. She just disappointed me terribly by not admitting that she, she worshipped Satan uh, as though he's not real at all. Uh, it was, at the time anyway, terribly disappointing for me. I actually want to believe in all of this because it leads inevitably back to God being real. And I guess that's what I'm searching for, Father. Well, I'm glad you're searching. That's uh, that's a positive. And um, you know, there there is much evidence that points to the existence of God. Um, now, can we prove the existence of God 100% scientifically? No, we cannot. Um, conversely, science cannot disprove the existence of God. Um, How about 70%? <laughs> what, <laughs> Listen, we've got a break. <laughs> Hold that thought. <laughs> 70%. Settled for 65, actually. We're talking about actual proof, of course, it's going to be very difficult. From the high desert and the great American Southwest, this is Midnight in the Desert. I'm Art Bell. are best handled by those that understand how to move in the darkness, like Art Bell. To call the show, please dial 1-952-CALL-ART. That's 1-952-225-5278. Father Jack Ashcraft is my guest. Father, welcome back. Um, yeah, you're taking some heat here. Uh, Ryan from Wenatchee asks, would you ask Father Ashcraft to tell you his, tell you his academic credentials? Uh, where did he get his bachelor's degree and his master's in divinity? Why does he care about the current pope if he doesn't believe that it's proper? <laughs> I attended a private city vacata seminary program. Okay. It was a mentorship program. It is not accredited because we were not seeking to um, achieve academic credentials. We were looking for... Uh, any any um, state of Acanta seminary, such as Most Holy Seminary or uh, Most Holy Trinity Seminary in Florida, they're not accredited because you're not looking for um, some sort of academic standing. They're the function of a seminary under traditional Catholic uh, teaching is to produce priests, priests for the church. Sure. And uh, um, so, 
you know, the, the notion of accreditation and, and things like that didn't come into the, to the, uh, the question because we are not, um, academics. We okay. are, um, sacramental priests. Our okay. bishops are sacramental bishops. And we take a traditional Catholic uh, approach to the formation of priests. Mm-hmm. It's a seven year education. Um, you know, you study philosophy, you study theology, sacramentology, eschatology, etc. Now, okay. beyond that, I am currently working toward my master's degree at oh. a seminary in uh, Cincinnati, Ohio. So. All right, fine. Uh, thank you for the answer. Now, on to TJ, who hits us up with really not loving the homophobic bigotry sigh. Um, years ago, I said on the air and still maintain today, Father, um, that, you know, if two men or two women want to get married, I don't care. I, I'm not cool with it. I don't, you know, I, I how can I put this? Um, it just doesn't personally affect me. If it makes them happy and they want to get married and uh, head down that, that road, which is not all joy in every case, um, then go ahead. Mm-hmm. Um, I take it you, you take a very conservative approach to it, and I, I believe in the Bible that is supported, yes? Yes, certainly. Um, you know, Scripture is very clear about the nature of homosexuality, and it is not homophobia. Um, I am not fearful of homosexuals. I do not hate homosexuals. I, uh, I care about the homosexual as much as I do about the alcoholic and, uh, you know, anybody else. I also want to point out that, uh, homosexuality is, uh, is just as much a sin as adultery, uh, heterosexual adultery mm-hmm. or heterosexual fornication mm-hmm. they're all wrong i look at them all equally they're all wrong i don't hate uh the fornicator uh the heterosexual adulterer and i don't hate the homosexual um and and i think that is one of the uh, the problems in the discourse on these topics is that uh, you know you have one side who wants to get vitriolic and um, uh, you know cast aspersions on on the people who hold a biblical worldview. Sure. If a, um, if a gay person comes to you for um, counsel, do you give it? Certainly, absolutely, I would. Um, you know, I'd give it to anyone who came to me. Um, you know, I, I I can't address the constitutional issues involved in the the recent uh, uh, marriage thing. Well, you don't have issue. to. The U.S. Supreme Court's doing that for you. Yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, you know, I that out of you know, I'm not even addressing that. The the idea though that um, it doesn't affect me, which it might be true for someone who um, isn't. It doesn't have a biblical worldview, or uh, even if you're a moderate Muslim who doesn't have an Islamic worldview, or a Hindu, you know, a, a traditional Hindu who, you know, also takes the same viewpoint. The, the point is that it, it does affect us, and we're seeing that play out in the courts right now, where we're having people uh, uh, who are running. Marriage chapels who are being forced now, told that they have to perform these ceremonies, despite the fact that they have a religious objection, right. which is provided for in our uh, the documents of our our country. Um, it, but that's not that's not being respected in the courts, and so it it does affect the church. And one of the proponents of gay marriage. Um, I can't remember his name, but um, there was an interview with him, and he said, uh, he was asked, will this affect the churches? And he said, well, certainly of necessity, it will affect the churches. Right. And he said it, it would probably start on the level of their tax-exempt status. Hmm. So, uh, you know, will it affect the church? I I think it's very possible that it will, and I think we're seeing that play out. Um, but, uh, you know, I, 
I don't hate homosexuals, and I'm not, af- not afraid of them or fearful of them. I've got it. Um, I have, uh, uh, and I, I just find that that sort of uh, discourse counterproductive. I take it though that if two, if if a pair came to you and wanted you to perform such a ceremony, you would not do that. I cannot do that. Cannot do that. All Correct. right. Um, it sounds like there is a lot of trouble ahead then. Uh, or will the church, what do you think the church will officially do? Yeah, that's a good question. I think personally, I think the fact that the churches are um, involved in the tax exemption is a mistake to begin with. Uh, uh-huh. Really? Yes. I, I don't think churches should have been involved in that. Um, part of the reason is that uh, one of the um, one of the hooks of that uh, tax exempt status is that churches really cannot legally um, advocate for any particular political party or candidate. Right. And uh, uh, you know, if if churches want to be involved in politics, which I'm again, I'm not a big fan of that either, <laughs> um, then tax exemption is a mistake. Beyond that, my personal view is that, and I take a very Antonicene view of the church. I go back to you know, the, the apostles and the men who knew the apostles and studied directly with them. And look, I look at what they had to say at the, uh, of, of the church, and I take their view. All right, Father. Hold tight. We'll be right back. Night in the Desert spans the world. To call us from outside the U.S. and Canada only, use Skype with a headset mic if on a computer and call MITD55. That's MITD55. Father Jack Ashcroft is my, Ashcraft actually, is my guest. And um, I guess I'm getting him confused with Leo, our news guy. <laughs> Not surprising, a lot of you did too. Actually, no relation, several have asked. All right, um, Father, here we go again. Uh, Nathan from Austin, Texas asks, could you please ask the Father, if the Catholic Church is corrupt or rotten, does that not give legitimacy to Protestants? Are there mistakes in the Bible, women not speaking in church, death for working on Sunday, and so forth? Okay, I'll try to uh, <laughs> I'll try to condense this a bit. Um the, the first thing you have to understand is that according to the state of a conscious position, there, there is no corruption in the church. The church was infiltrated. The visible institutions were taken over. But the church consists of clergy and laity faithful to the true teachings of the faith. Um, therefore, state of a and other traditionalists who reject the changes who reject the current hierarchy, they are the church. Right, but he was speaking to the the, the one, you know, the Vatican one. And, and well, I mean, the, the fact that uh, there's corruption there, uh, for us, proves that it's not the church. This doesn't mean there's a defect in Scripture or anything like that, and... Uh, um, nor, and, and I think if I understand the question correctly, nor does that uh, mean that uh, such things as uh, women not holding the priesthood, et cetera, are wrong, nor does that follow. Um, the, the, uh, what you have with the visible institution that people think of as the Catholic Church is what we call the Novus Ordo. Uh, the New Order mm-hmm. Church, mm-hmm. and uh, um, that's a term they used for their own uh, liturgy. Um, and so it's a wholly different religion. Does it lend uh, credence to Protestantism? No, not necessarily. Um, when you consider that, uh, you know, St. Vicantas believe that the church continues to exist uh, in them 
in their midst, in their churches, in their chapels, and uh, with their priests and their lady, then uh, um, no, it wouldn't lend support to Protestantism at all. Protestantism um, actually came out of well, okay, uh, but 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 again, Father, he's he's asking about not your church. Maybe I can put it that way. He's asking about the, the Vatican's official position on things, and, and you will come back and say, well, the Vatican is not official because I understand right. that. <laughs> yeah, I, understand I mean, you can't, you can't accept what's coming out of the Vatican right. because the Vatican is occupied by non-Catholics. So, Whew. Oh, you're going to get a letter. I'm sure of it. <laughs> um, well, all right. Uh, what do you know about the ability of somebody like Blanche or uh, anybody on the, the other side able to, is a, can a curse really be made a, and work? Well, certainly. Um, however, the only way they can have an effect is if the target of that curse is not in a state of sanctifying grace. The further they move from Christ and his protection, um, the more susceptible they are to that sort of an attack. Well, maybe it's a comment on, on, on the current times, but sorry, it's a target-rich environment. Oh, certainly. Absolutely. And and I think um, I think there are, where there are cases of uh, real curses... Um, you know, you're going to find it just as you said that these these individuals, these targets, um, are not in a state of sanctifying grace. They're outside that. It's it, it, and because of that, um, there is not much that any priest can do to help them until they get their spiritual lives in order, and um, that sometimes you you will even um, uh, encounter resistance to that from the people who are actually feeling the effects of a curse or feeling the effects of demonic attack, they will still push back on you when you mm-hmm. tell them, here's the remedy, because it requires something of them. Yes. And, and let's be honest, uh, the, the spirit of the age is, I don't want anything required of me. I want to do my own thing. So com- coming in and getting in a little wood booth and having a confession just might not do the trick totally. Well, no, certainly not. Um, it requires that one live what uh, what you claim to believe. Um, you know, you have to put your money where your mouth is, so to speak. Mm-hmm. You, you can't simply... Uh, you know, attend a church. You can't simply receive sacraments and go through the motions and expect to be okay. It requires more of you. There has to be substance, the substance of faith, which is demonstrated by actually living the gospel of Christ. All right. So in other words, you you really are saying, look, it, you may be possessed uh, or you may be under the influence of a curse or something evil, but unless you change... My showing up as a priest and doing whatever I'm going to do isn't going to do the job. No, it certainly won't. Um, it's it's there's a joint effort there in exorcism, um, in any type of spiritual warfare intervention. It is a joint effort. Uh, the priest and and the person coming to the priest for that help. They have to work together. And if that person is not willing to do what it takes to amend their lives, to get their spiritual lives in order, there is nothing any priest can do to help them. It's like with perfect possession, and I'm sure Father Martin told you this. Um, there's nothing you can do to help that person. Right. They've made they their have, deal. They, they were, yeah, yeah. Yeah. They have willed themselves in the position they're in. And without the active role of their will to reverse that, there's nothing that can be done. Whew. Um, yeah, so people are always saying they see times coming of, you know, the end days, Armageddon, as it were, and frankly, looking around the world today, 
and and maybe it's just you know my we have short lives <laughs> we don't live long but it does seem that even in my lifetime i have seen so much i'm now 70 uh and i've seen so much of a moral and spiritual decline in the world that it does seem like the end days Oh, I see. We have the little internet thing come up, so he can't answer that just yet. There he is, Father. Um, did you you heard what I said, right? Uh, part of it. Okay. Oh, part. Also, it's cutting out over there too a little bit. Um, I said that you know I'm 70 years old now. I've seen a big spiritual moral decline in the world. Um, even in our own country now, um, I don't want to talk politics particularly, but I do want to say this. We have this guy now, Trump, and he's just a wild man, an absolute wild man by any current political standards, and he is way, way ahead. I think that people, uh, a lot of them, thankfully, I guess, are so fed up, and I've said this before and I'm going to say it again, that they're virtually... Politically speaking, if and I'll hold it there, they're ready to burn it all down. And that's why Trump is as popular as he is right now. So oh, yeah, yeah, I think I think you're seeing and, and it's not just a a social condition. I think there's a spiritual condition behind this. Um and it mirrors that which was in uh Weimar, Germany. Um you know, the same you know, desperation. It might be some of the same. You're right. Yeah. And and it's that same desperation that allows for very masterful manipulators like uh, Hitler and Stalin and people like that to come along and and uh, really do some damage. You really think we're at that susceptible point? I think I think that we're getting close if not there. Um you know, have have you really listened to or viewed some of the things people say on these political oh, yes. message boards? Oh, I mean, absolutely, yes. Mm-hmm. There's this visceral desperation mixed with a lot of really bad information out there, disinformation, I would say. And, uh, uh, you know, people are willing. Okay. I think he just went away again. Um, we've got a problem uh, with Skype, and this is kind of abby normal, because generally with Skype, uh, it just stays connected. That's the way it is. It stays connected. But in this case, um, Father Ashcraft goes away for a moment. I get a little notice saying, well, there's a problem with this call. Hold on while we try to get the call back, and it will reestablish here in a moment. I've never quite seen this occur with Skype uh, before, but the Internet, of course, is a great connected network, and things can go wrong all over the place. All right, Father, you're back again. Um, I have no idea what's doing that. I was just talking about the interconnected uh, network that we have, and, you know, it just takes one little thing somewhere in that network to go sideways, and there you go. Um, All right, let's quickly get into, while we can, uh, jump to your, you've, you've had many cases apparently because you talk a lot about exorcism. What would you say was your most frightening case? Oh, good question. <laughs> <laughs> um, the most frightening case, I guess, would be not one that to be uh, demonic at all, uh, but one that was brought to me from a uh, television production. Um, and I won't name what the production was. I, I don't people, mind if you if you want to name it. I don't care. Um, well, it, it came to me from a Paranormal State. Okay. Uh, when that program was on, and they brought me this this case that uh, became sort of infamous in their uh, series. It was this young lady who they uh, felt was possessed and they they brought to me some photographs and a synopsis of the case Mm -hmm. I looked at the photographs and there were scratches on her body but they weren't anywhere she couldn't reach Um, and uh, there was a a message in one of them scratched into her torso 
And after reviewing it, I sent it, I sent it back to them stating I didn't see anything there that was demonic. It looked to me like it was psychological. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, they went ahead and ran with it and performed a, they called it an exorcism. It really wasn't, um, on their TV show of this young lady. Subsequently, they went back and did it again. Who, who um, did the exorcism? Uh, the first time, I, I don't recall the gentleman's name. He's deceased now. Okay. I do know that. The second time, it was a, uh, a Novus Ordo priest who uh, admits that he's not an exorcist, uh, but he went up there and tried to, uh, to do what he could anyway, without really doing any investigation, obviously. Um, and at the end of the day, it turned out that I was correct. This girl was seeing a psychologist. Um, she was on medication and her involvement with that program apparently caused her family some trouble in the community they live in. Mm. Um, and I say that. Uh oh. Um, I, okay, I'm not quite on to it and I was about to ask and I'm sticking with this because I really want to know. Uh, I was about to ask. If that was the the scariest that um, that he's seen, um, it apparently was you know up to the point he was telling us it wasn't real, right? In other words, he had uh, judged it to be scratches that she could have put on herself. Okay, F- Father, welcome back. So I, I say having... that's frightening because um, yes, I was wondering about that. It, it yeah. <laughs> sounded like because... it was not a real case. Right, because you have this uh, paranormal subculture who they think they have a grasp on these things, and they don't. Ah. And what they do is they ignore the psychological, they ignore the environmental, um, and as a result, they cause more damage, like they did in this case. Hmm. Um, Just think, though, I mean... the. The best thing we could say about this case was that the girl was suffering from some form of depression, as I understand it. Um, okay, let me think, let me reword my question. What was the most frightening case that you've dealt with that was real? <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, I would have to say the case of a, uh, a young lady who, um, this was in Kentucky, um, who was experiencing objects levitating in her home, um, words appearing on the wall, oh. um, and uh, not just witnessed by herself, not just hearsay, but witnessed by several people, including a psychiatrist um, oh. who was really at a loss as to how... It had been produced. Sure, if I was a psychiatrist and saw something levitate, um, I'd be calling you or somebody like you right away. Well, you know, even with things like that, you'll find that there's, people remain skeptical um, because there is the role of parapsychology in there. Um, it's not unknown for uh, women, especially women going through... Uh, times of severe stress to be able to to manipulate their environments like that to cause objects to move especially young teenage girls but it, yes but what what really moved this case beyond the parapsychological were uh, the words appearing on the wall um, that moved it beyond that so for me that was scary um, and and uh, not scary in that oh I'm running away, but just frightening in the demonstrative nature of the case. Did you or anybody else actually witness the words manifesting on the wall? Yes, I did. Oh my, that'd do it for me, all right. Yeah, <laughs> it, uh, it it'll definitely shake you up. Can those time. can those words be repeated? No, no. Okay, I do have a rule on this show, but I I wouldn't like them if I heard them. I take it. 
No, and I wouldn't repeat those words anyway. Good. All right. Uh, so, in other words, you really you you've encountered the real thing. There's no question about it. Oh yeah, absolutely. You know that I hate to say it again, but I will. That actually gives me a warm and fuzzy feeling because if the one is true, the other has to be true. Um, you know that's insufficient to really say, but uh, but I really do mean that. And I want to ask you about something else: ghosts. Are ghosts can ghosts, in your opinion, be real in the sense that they are? residual or entities of people who are once alive human beings? Well, theologically speaking, you have a, uh, a variety of different opinions on that. Do you have some who believe that ghosts um, are the spirits of those in purgatory who are right. seeking our prayers, and so they appear in order to solicit those prayers? Stuck in the middle. Correct. Some... Uh, others um, state that uh, ghosts do not appear, that those are purely demonic entities masquerading as the spirits of the dead or our dead relatives in order to mislead us into believing things that are not true. Mm. And and so, um, you know, you have both of those viewpoints of the spiritual realm. You find that um, when you get into these these topics theologically, uh, you know there there are all these different schools of thought on this, and one has to simply find what they think fits best. All right, Father, hold tight. We will open the line shortly. So if you've got a call, if you've got a question or a statement, all I ask is you be. I want you to be polite. All right, be polite. I'm Art Bell. This is Midnight in the Desert. Something weird is happening. Something I can't deny. A strange kind of Take a ride from the high desert and the great American Southwest. This is Midnight in the Desert, exclusively on the Dark Matter Digital Network. To call the show, dial 1-952-CALL-ART. That's 1-952-225-5278. That's it. Father Jack Ashcraft is my guest. And, um, again, I'm going to now give out the phone numbers, and uh, I hope you will join us. Actually, you've already joined us. The lines are full. Nevertheless, the public line is area code 952-225-5278. You can get in on Skype ever so easily. If you're uh, in North America, America or Canada, simply enter MITD51. That's as in midnight in the desert, MITD. It's not case sensitive, 51. If you are outside the U.S., uh, anywhere outside the U.S., in the greater wide world, uh, please enter MITD55 into Skype. That's MITD55. And in those ways, you can call us. Now, let me stress this. If you get through and you hear audio, if you hear us doing the show, that means you have made it through. So hold on. Don't hang up. If, on the other hand, you ring and it's never answered, ring some more. <laughs> we'll eventually get to you. All right, Father Ashcraft, once again, hopefully his Skype holds up. It's kind of coming and going. I, I don't know why, but uh, eh, it's, a, it's a web of a world we live in. And again, I ask you to uh, please just, whatever else you do, uh, be polite, because I know you've ignited some tempers out there, Father. <laughs> um, so away we go. Let's answer a few calls, and I've I've got other questions as well. Let's start, I guess, with Matthew um, somewhere or another on Skype. Hi, Matthew. Hello, Art. This is Matthew, the Sunday school teacher, calling from West Virginia. Okay. I'm just disappointed that this man denies the authority of the Holy See and the false prophet Pope Francis, but will not accept justification by faith alone. 
But that's not my question. Well, uh, let him respond to that, uh, okay. or at least uh, I'm soothe, sorry. soothe your disappointment, or yes, not, sir. or not, Father. Well, Scripture says we're. I'm getting a little bit of feedback there, or um, Scripture says that we are justified by grace through faith. So um, I would say that biblically speaking, you're a little off. Okay. Did you hear that, caller? Uh, yes, sir. I know where he's coming from. He's familiar, no doubt, with the epistle of James. But this is a theological difference we won't be able to settle on air. I do have a question, however. All right. Proceed with your question. If he denies the authority of the Holy See, where does he receive the sacraments from? All right. Father? Well, the sacraments don't have to proceed from the authority of the Holy See. The sacraments are conflicted through uh, any priest who has valid apostolic succession. Um, and uh, as long as he follows the proper uh, form, has the proper intention, and the proper matter, then a sacrament is confected validly. And so any priest who is also validly uh, ordained in apostolic concession can do so as long as he follows those three guidelines. Okay. Allentown, Pennsylvania, on the phone. You're on with Father Ashcraft. Hi, Art. This is Johnny from PA. Yes, sir. And uh, I called in when uh, the Satanist was on the other night, and my my views are obviously oppositional to hers. I'm in the Father's corner. I'm not going to be oppositional. Still challenging, I think, but not oppositional. Um, so the first question is in regards to the uh, the prophecies of St. Malachi. Um, according to those prophecies, the way most people interpret them, Benedict was Gloria Olive. We should be on uh, Petrus Romanus, Peter the Roman, who seems to be a very good pope according to the prophecies. This pope doesn't seem to be a very good pope, and I'm wondering what his thoughts are. Um, the, the, the supposed prophecies of St. Malachi, there's a, a lot of contention there as to whether they are legitimately so or not. Some say they're forgeries. Um, so I, I really don't take a, a position... Um, on those particularly because, uh, you know, anything of doubtful origin is, shouldn't really be used as evidence. Not to mention, I, I, I am somebody who leans towards scripture more than extra biblical prophecy. And, uh, so that's where I will, uh, keep my eschatology is with scripture. Art, can I ask one more? Yes. Uh, the other one would be if someone was under demonic oppression, uh, and I, if I told you my stories, you'd probably start laughing. Um, if someone was under that, what would you suggest they do? And I'll take the, the uh, answer off the air. Okay. Fine. Well, um, without knowing the specific um, area of oppression, uh, I can't address it well and adequately. Um, I would, however, encourage you, if you are experiencing what you believe to be oppression, to examine your life, find out um, where your weakest point is spiritually, and shore that up, because chances are that's where you're being hit. Satan always hits people at their weakest point. See, that makes sense to me. It really does. Um Zachary on Skype, you're on the air. Hello? Yes, hello. Get close to your microphone, Zachary, or you'll sound like you're in a tunnel. Hi. Hi. I have a question for Jack. Go ahead. Um, why haven't you, if you've experienced these uh, demonic uh, oppressions, uh, recorded them? Well, he probably has. Um Father, have you uh, have you recorded or um, what's the right word? I guess evidenced in some way uh, what what you've been through. Okay, we've we've lost him unfortunately on Skype. Sorry about that. This is a problem that we normally never experience. Um, when doing these kinds of shows. I mean, when he is there, this is kind of odd. He's absolutely there, and the audio is absolutely perfect, just like he was in the room, and then suddenly it cuts out, uh, and it automatically reestablishes, and here he is. Uh, yeah, I, to, to answer that question... Oh, good, you got it. Say, <laughs> yeah, 
I want to say first of all that um, uh, anything that is recorded is is only recorded for the uh, bishop, my bishop. Right. Um, it would never be made public, and I, I think those who do make that that sort of thing public um, are really uh, in, in violating what I think to be a, a very um, private matter. Um, mm-hmm. it, it causes a lot of problems for families, and uh, as in the, the case that I mentioned earlier. Right. Uh, Father, you were involved, uh, or not involved necessarily, but uh, the film The Exorcism of Emily Rose, uh, you're suggesting it was uh, a real case, or were you involved in it? I wasn't involved in the case, no. It, it was... Uh, it was a case uh, in the 1970s um, in Germany, and it, it, the movie is loosely based on on that case. And it was a, a German girl by the name of Annalisa Michael, uh-huh. and uh, um, I I did converse uh, back and forth, uh, correspond with Dr. Felici. And there he goes again. Very annoying. Uh, to have Skype do this, and uh, it may be some expert out there on Skype understands what's going on. But I do get a message indicating that his, um, and there it is, it, it disconnect, and it shows, you know, kind of like your cell phone, you have a bunch of bars, right, F- five red bars. And that's exactly what it's showing, five red bars, as though there is no Internet on his side, which sounds like, frankly, a loose cable or something. Father, are you back? Yes, I'm here. I I can hear you. Um, the 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 case was a German girl, and uh, uh, I conversed or corresponded with Dr. Felicitas Goodman, who was an anthropologist mm-hmm. who studied the case. Um, and uh, unfortunately, it was one of those cases where I, I tend to agree with the court that the priests. Um, were negligent because this young lady did suffer from a form of epilepsy and they did uh, allow her to stop taking her medication during the exorcism. Mm-hmm. That was a huge error. But it was one of those rare cases where you have mental illness or, or in this case, uh, yeah, it's actually a physical illness, temp- uh, epilepsy, um, attendant to a case of demonic possession. She was possessed but there was negligence involved there as well. So the actual number of possessions, uh, real possessions, is in your opinion low or simply unknown? Um, I think it's unknown, but I think it's certainly lower than the number of claims. <laughs> That's for sure. Um, you know, I, I receive hundreds of claims in a year's time and and there are people that have been trained to investigate those um, uh, on the temporal level that is uh, the psychological the uh, environmental etc and um, uh, I'll forward those cases to those those persons uh, who do so and uh, 99% of the cases come back as something quite uh, quite uh, normative for the human experience. Hamilton, uh, Ontario, I believe. You're on the air. Uh, I wondered what Father Ashcroft thought about um, Fatima, because the reason why I'm asking, I find your program extremely interesting oh, it is. in the sense that I've, I've never heard of a Catholic priest that didn't um, endorse the Vatican. But on the other hand, I have friends who are um, into the Fatima uh, aspect of it. And Fatima, there's a priest in Fort Erie that deals with that. But some of the Catholic people, I I live near a cathedral, and they say that uh, what he's doing with Fatima has nothing to do with the Vatican. All right, all right. One one thing at a time. Um, Caller, I can tell you, trust me, Okay. There are okay. other priests that do not endorse what's going on at the Vatican right now or what has been going on for some time. 
And that includes I didn't father, know that. and that and that includes Father Malachi Martin, a very great man indeed. So yes, are, you you mentioned him. He, oh yes, 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 yes. So well, it, I've never his, his name is Father Martin. Yes, uh, he's now passed on, Father Malachi okay. Martin. Yes. Uh, okay. So there are many priests like that. Second part of your question, Father. Um, he he had a question about what I thought about Fatima. That's right. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, it's an approved apparition of the uh, of the church, and uh, so uh, the Catholic faithful are endorse it. Okay, I think he disappeared again. Uh, yes, the See, the answer to your question is yes. Uh, okay. He, he I mean, I, be I believe in it too, but the thing is, is that, um, in other words. I, the signal I'm getting from you is that just because it may not be endorsed by the Vatican really doesn't mean anything when it comes to God. Um, I, I would let Father handle that one, thank you. Not me. Okay. Uh, he's temporarily disconnected, Father. If you can hear me, you might move well, your wires around a little bit or something. I don't know what's going you, on. You understand what I'm saying, though. Um, I do. I do. That's what I thought all the way along. No, he, when people tell me... Yeah, he endorses uh, Fatima as the Church does. Yeah, and and as far as traditional uh, or Catholic priests who don't uh, accept what's going on with the Vatican, um, there are entire societies of priests who don't. Um, the Society of Saint Pius V. Um, I didn't know that. The Congregation of Mary Immaculate uh, Queen (CMRI). Um, mm -hmm. On and on, there there are entire sacerdotal societies um, who are sedevacantists and, and reject this. There there are also the Society of Saint Pius the Tenth who are not uh, sedevacantists, uh, and they recognize the hierarchy, but they reject their uh, what they rightly see as their heretical teachings. So um, there are a lot of us out there. Very interesting. I'm going to have to Google that word, Seda Vicatus. I've never heard of it, but very interesting is all I can say. All right. All right. Um, very good. Well, we did explain it at the beginning of the program. You might want to go back. Um, Bedford, Indiana, I think. Hi. Hey, what's going on, mate? Uh, I don't allow full names on the air. We'll just go with Jason. You have a question. Yes, I do. I am a time traveler. Okay. How are you? Um, interviewing a Catholic priest. Uh, what is your question? Art Bell. That I'm would be so me, glad yes. glad you are back on the air. Thank you. You are a life saver. No, uh, that would be the father, not me. Uh, let me see. Let's go here and say, hello, you're on the air. Oh, I just wanted to find out if uh, Father uh, Jack um, has a contact phone number to get a hold of or an email address. Um, well, careful, Father. Uh, <laughs> There's an email address on my website. There is an email address on his website, which is uh, what? what? But what about a physical address as well? No, we're not going to give that out on the air. Come okay, on. Okay, okay. As soon okay. as you cough up your social security number, we'll think about it. Okay, right. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yeah, you're very welcome. Sheesh. Stuff people answer, ask for. Um, hello there. North Hollywood, California, I think. Uh, oh, no, actually, this is Larry from Hawaii again. Okay, you need to correct you your caller ID. <laughs> okay, I'll do that. You may remember me. I was the second to last caller with Blanche on. Okay. And anyway, um, my question for the Father is that uh, in regards to this apparent uh, surge and incursion of UFOs and ET abductions, what your view is on that? I and mean, could it possibly be the uh, coming deception spoke of in New Testament? Okay. Well, in short, I think that you have several things going on with the uh, UFO and alien abduction phenomenon. I think you have uh, governmental projects going on there that are being mistaken for UFOs. Mm -hmm. um, I think you also have, in the alien abduction scenario, uh, there is a, a sub-Rosa level 
uh, psychological operation going on there. Wow. Um, and uh, and then finally, I think that there are some cases that um, I would say are demonic. All right. I'm going to toss one at you. Okay. Father, I've done a number of, um, I would call them very, very impressive shows on out-of-body experiences. Mm-hmm. Now, I'm sure you're familiar with the term OBE, right? Yes. So when that occurs, Father, it, would it be your view uh, that, a person's soul is actually leaving their body, or is something else happening? Uh, wow, well, I think that uh, what you're looking at there is the the, uh, the spirit um, leaving the body. I think it's a dangerous practice. Oh, you do? Um, yes, I've I, thought the same thing. Yeah, um, we have had cases of possession that were caused directly by people uh, ha, ha, experimenting ha. with that. Ha, ha. Uh, All and, right, I'm going to remember this forever um, because I have a lot of people who talk about OBs. Oh, they're wonderful, they say. There is a silver cord attached to you that will always bring you back to your body when anything threatening occurs at all. And uh, and generally people, and I had somebody really who was good with OBEs on recently, and he started out by saying, there is absolutely not a thing in the world dangerous about leaving your body, about doing OBEs. And then, uh, a little later in the interview, he proceeded to tell me about two or three dangerous things that actually did happen to him when he left his body. So, you're saying it is dangerous. Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, when you when you leave your body like that, yes, sir. Um, you create a space that something can fill. And um, so the demonic can certainly fill that space. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's go to Skype. Uh, Jeff, you're on the air with uh, Father Ashcraft. Hi. Hey, Art. It's good to uh, have you back on the air. It's Thank awesome. You. Thank you. Um, I'll go by the code name Jeff Scepter, Dallas, Texas. Okay. And uh, my question is, I have I have had a close friend in the past who uh, she's Catholic, and I'm I'm not Catholic myself. Right. Um, she started getting into watching a lot of television uh, ministry shows that were strictly about uh, prophecy, the end times kind of stuff. Uh, strictly focusing on that as far as a religious aspect. And at first it didn't really bother me much, uh, but then it, she turned in really incredibly violent and, uh, some of my friends and stuff said they literally thought she was possessed by the, literally the look, look in her eyes and whatnot. Right. And, and I, I'm just wondering, um, you know, do you have any pointers or anything like that that would stand out as far as, you know, it's you know. I mean, you see the movies like Exorcist and stuff like that, and you see all these crazy movie drama things. But when in real, in real life, possessed, yeah. to, what do you see on that? Well, uh, it, you know, it it varies from person to person. There are some typical signs we look for. Um, what are but, those? Well, I mean, some of those are speaking a language that they have never studied, right? Um, especially dead languages. Um, uh, knowledge of things that they couldn't know normally, um, things that are secret or hidden, mm-hmm. um, and and of course the the ability to move objects, things like that. Um, there is, and, and I want to address one of the things he's mentioned here is this: there can be a morbid preoccupation with uh, the end times and sure. with the demonic. And that morbid preoccupation itself can be a doorway to demonic activity. Um, and, and it's because there's no balance in spiritual life. And there is an entire uh, industry out there in what I call fringe evangelicalism that focuses on this stuff almost entirely. And the substance of these people's faith is in this, uh, the various theories that are proposed and, uh, the books that 
these authors put out, you know, month after month. Um, and when that's the substance of your faith and it's focused on the demonic yeah. and the dark, right. um, you know, inevitably that's going to have an To initiate a dialogue sequence with Art Bell, please coordinate your phalanges and call 1-952-225-5278. That's 1-952-CALL-ART. <laughs> All right, uh, Father, it's going to be a very short break this time. Um, let's, uh, let's take a, I guess, a quick call. Um, what should it be? Well, we'll go here. We'll go to the phone. Hello, you're on with Father uh, Jack Ashcraft. Hey, how you doing, Art? I'm doing okay, sir. What's up? Let me let me start by saying first, great to have you back, and then I got a question for Father Ashcraft. Proceed. Um, I do ghost hunting, and I know. Am I allowed to say other TV programs on here or not? Yes, I don't care. Okay, I do ghost hunting. I know he's been involved with uh, Ghost Adventures. And I'm wondering what his opinion of ghost hunting is, Father. Um. <laughs> I dissuade people from doing so. I told the people at uh, uh, Ghost Adventures the same thing, that they should stop doing this, that they weren't dealing with ghosts, and that it was dangerous. Um, but, of course, when you're making a living at that, you're not going to listen to anything I have to say. <laughs> well, um, how about me? I talk about these kinds of things. As a matter of fact, I have people on the air who do... EVPs. In fact, we're about to do a show on EVPs. You know what those are, right, Father? Yes, yes, of course. Uh, discussion of the topic isn't the problem. It's when you're out. Okay, it's something, and then you went away. Um, I guess you lost him again. Yeah, I guess we did. Um, so I took it from what he said when he was there that uh, he he doesn't like, uh, he doesn't want to be involved in anything hunting ghosts on TV or otherwise. Okay, I'm just curious, though, then why did he go on the show? Um, well, that's a good question. If we had him back, I, I would ask. Uh, what did he do on the show, do you recall? Uh, he was actually helping them start investigations and talking with people. So, Well, maybe after... He... Whether people... Okay, Father, uh, very quickly, you were on the show, right? Yes, I was. And, they asked uh, me to help on a on a case. Yeah. I see. Okay. And how did that work out? Or is well, it the one we talked about? They uh, no, it was a different thing completely. Different thing. This was just a property, and uh, they asked me to bless the property, which I did, and that includes a oh. it's called a minor exorcism, and uh, it got marketed as a big exorcism issue. And gotcha. Well, that's television. All right. Father, hold on. I'm sorry the brakes are so close together, but we got them squeezed. We'll be right back. This is Midnight in the Desert. I'm Art Bell. Been reported to local police, um, and when you when I consider that and I consider what Father Martin went through mm. as, a, as a result of his candor, sure, um, I have to be measured. So please uh, understand that and, and don't feel like I'm trying to shortchange you. You're not shortchanging me. Um, death threats. Uh, death threats, why, Father? Over what issue? Several. Um, mainly my opinion about the Vatican. Huh. Um, well, certainly, uh, uh, Father Martin held, held a very similar opinion, and I guess we can imagine what might have happened to him. So I do understand. Trust me, I do understand. Uh, Kurt, on Skype, you're on the air with Father. Hello? Oh, my mute, my mute button on again. Okay, Sorry well, about that. Don't leave hey, it on when you're calling a radio program. I know. Music my goodness that. gracious. Okay. I should have learned by now. Let me turn your thing down here. Okay, good. <laughs> um, hey, are gay people going to hell? <laughs> um, what do you believe? Okay. Tell me. Well, I wish he was here to answer. He has blinked out on us there, again. Yeah, he may be hearing us. Uh, Father, the question was, are gay people going to hell? 
<laughs> or gay people going to hell? That's the question. Okay. I have another one too later. Well, just hold on. Okay. Let me let me preface this by saying that uh, the fall of humanity had an effect on everyone, every single person in existence. Um, that fall did not just have spiritual implications, but physical. We grow old. We get diseases, we die, we get psychological problems, uh, a whole host of things as a result of the fall. Um, I tend to view homosexuality, if there is indeed a genetic component, I tend to view it in light of the fall of humanity. That is the an effect of the fall, just like uh, the common cold would be an effect of the fall. Now, having said that... Um, is a homosexual going to go to hell? Mm-hmm. Not necessarily. If the homosexual is not acting on the homosexual desires, they're doing their best to live the gospel of Christ, then they have as much opportunity to uh, achieve salvation as anybody else. All right. Uh, let me stop you cold, Father, and ask you if science conclusively proves that homosexuality is a genetic matter that that, that um, yes people have desire but it's driven by a, a genetic predisposition if that is proven absolutely then wouldn't that affect your opinion uh, it would just as I said it, I would view that as part of an, uh, the effects of the fall of man um, and uh, wow. no different thing. Yeah, but uh, in other words, if it was a genetic-driven situation, this is the way they were born, this is the way they are, that is that, then uh, surely no fair God would doom them to hell. Well, the, the Scripture still says that it's uh, it's sinful. It, it does say that. To, to act on it. Yeah, well, it was uh, it was written yeah. a long, long time ago, Father, uh, before genetic science came along, by well, fair margin. And, and and taking a strict biblical worldview as I do, um, you know, the we can also look at uh, fornication and adultery sure. being results of the fall as well. There's still no less sins just because uh, you know we're we're um, somehow. Uh, dis- disposed to committing these acts. Um, well, that's fair. I, I mean, you could say a man is driven, uh, some men, a lot of men, uh, even me when I was in my 20s, driven to just about chase anything with a skirt. Yeah. <laughs> correct. correct. Uh, so, I mean, so I'm it, as, anyway, it, it, caller, you had another question. I don't. He's no Father Malachi. I'm just going to end the call now. Good, bu- good All right, night. Good night. Right. All right. So he is no Father Malachi. He says he doesn't say he is Father Malachi. Nope. And um, and what you're getting is an honest uh, opinion, whether you like it or not. And I I do understand that. Um, look, we live in a different world these days. Um, I do disagree with you on gays, Father, um, and, and that's okay. I have to live with that disagreement, I guess. But you do understand that in this day and age, you're going to take, um, and you're gone, so this isn't fair. <laughs> I was going to say in this day and age, and I'll say it anyway, you're going to take an awful lot of heat for um, taking that position. But I also understand that that position is, I guess, backed up by what is written in the Bible. So when you do come back, I think I'm going to ask if everything written in the Bible is to be taken literally. That, uh, and so I'm going to ask that. Did you hear my question, Father? No, I'm sorry. Okay, so is everything written in the Bible to be taken absolutely literally in your view? Or is it possible that over thousands of years, some things that were written just might have been a view of somebody at that time and not the Word of God. Well, uh, that's not an option left to uh, a Catholic or any other Christian. To say that would be to undermine the uh, inerrancy and inspiration of sacred scripture. 
And uh, if if we say that about one portion of Scripture, then we have to call into question the entirety of it. But and, man, uh, man has fallacies, right? Man does, certainly. Okay, well, uh, these words, I don't know that they all came directly from God. They were written and possibly interpreted by man. Yes? Aww. What a poor time to have it blink out. I really hate that. In other words, um, some of what was written in the Bible certainly was um, uh, not the uh, direct uh, word of God. Not all of it was the direct word of God. Surely some of it has been interpreted, uh, transcribed by man. And we know that man is not perfect. Um, So you would take every word uh, in the Bible as literal, Father, right? I think to use the term literal is is a is a, a mistake. Uh, we're, you, you, we take the uh, the viewpoint of Scripture, as the Church always has, that uh, it is divinely inspired in its original autographs, and that God guided the authors to write what it was in His will for man to know mm-hmm. about His will, His person, and His plan. And that while he allowed man to use the language that uh, uh, was common to man at that time, uh, that the information contained therein is inerrant and infallible. And that is Orthodox Christian teaching across the board. That's not just me. That is Christianity across the world, Orthodox Christianity. I is. guess. I, You know, I, that that is where I will differ with you as well. I just can't believe that it could be that infallible, and I, I can't have faith that it is that infallible, and that is my sin, I guess. Um, Guthrie, Oklahoma, you're on the air with Father Ashcraft. Hi. Hello, Mr. Guthrie. Bell. Oh, there you are. Okay. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Mr. Bell, I just wanted to say it's an honor. I uh, used to listen to you when I was uh, very young in uh, 1990. Seven through 1999, I heard your interview with uh, Father Malachi, right. and uh, I was barely graduating from high school. I am now 34 years old, and you are a, a legend. Thank My you. mother's been listening to you for Okay, sir, years. I, please, I appreciate the greetings, but we have little time, and if you have a question for the Father, I'd appreciate it. Yes, sir. Uh, Father Ashcroft, what, what, what I have to ask is this one simple situation. Um, God gave us the ability to have free will. Um, he, he, he gave us the ability to think for ourselves and do what we want to do and have the ability to be as good as we want to be or as sinful as we want to be. And uh, from what I was told by one very intelligent minister that, uh, that I ran across in my lifetime, I was told that the only way that he can truly do that was to remove himself and remove all evidence of himself from for of a, of his existence to be able to give us the ability to have free will. Because if we were to look up in the sky, it would be like a police officer looking down <laughs> and us saying, "Yes, you got to do what you have to do because I'm watching you." If he had the ability to do that, and if he truly removed himself from our lives so that we had the ability to have free will then why are the the Satanists and uh, the very religious people trying to use the basis of of a book and everything, trying to scare us into doing the right thing when he alone gave us the ability to create our own decisions as we see fit and All right. to leave it up to us to okay. be a good person or not? All right. Thank you. Father? Okay. First thing is that, yes, we were given free will. Um, however, from the very first, man abused that uh, ability to use that free will wisely, prudently, um, by violating God's commandments in the garden. Um, to suggest that he hid himself, though, is is uh, not biblical. And you won't find that in, in Scripture, and you won't find that in the teachings of the church anywhere. As a matter of fact, uh the Apostle Paul tells us that uh, he has made himself known in the things he created. And as uh, Paul says there, he says, so speaking of those who don't believe, he says, so they are without excuse. 
in their disbelief. Um, God has made a witness of himself in a multitude of ways. And uh, the primary way is in the created world. And we can know God exists by the things he created. Of course, that gets us into a whole new topic on uh, creation and it does. evolution, etc. One I should have uh, started on much earlier. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, we don't really even have the time to get into that adequately. Well, this is why uh, God creates more radio time. And, <laughs> yeah. you know, we'll, we'll do yeah, another show. I to say sure. um, on, that, on that issue of, of uh, evolution, just really quickly, sure. is that uh, macroevolution... Oh. That's where he got cut off. Macro evolution. I really do want to hear what he has to say on that subject. So I will sit here and wait until the um, very tricky Internet allows the Father back on. Macro evolution. All right, Father, you're back. You, the last words I heard were macro evolution. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, the macro evolution uh, violates some scientific laws uh, in itself, one of those being the law of biogenesis. The law of bio- there it goes again. You know, I think that other church is at work here. <laughs> Something's going on, that's for sure. Um, this is uh, very unusual. Not sure exactly what in the internet could possibly be doing this, unless his provider is going on and off. Or perhaps his cable at the back of the um, a laptop or whatever he's using is a little bit uh, whacked out. And it's too bad because we're right at the end of the show. Father? Yes. Okay. Uh, we've got time. You, you, I heard macro evolution. Okay. <laughs> the last thing I heard. I apologize. I apologize for these drafts. I don't know what's going on with this. Um Macroevolution violates scientific laws. The very first one that it violates is the law of biogenesis. And the law of biogenesis tells us that life comes from life. Science has no evidence of life coming from nothing. Essentially, evolution must be taken on faith because it cannot prove its beginning point whatsoever. Mm-hmm. It is Evolution is essentially a religion that uh, relies on scientific language for its substance, but it has no real substance in and of itself. Hmm. All right, that is going to take another show to properly uh, digest. We we could talk a great deal about this. Do you believe, uh, Father, just sort of at the end of the program here, that God, and I'm sure you do, created the world as suggested in Genesis in uh, a matter of days. I do. I, I take a, uh, a very literal approach to the Genesis account of creation. I believe that God created everything that exists uh, just as it says in Genesis. Um, I am in complete agreement with the uh, the work of an organization called Answers in Genesis, mm-hmm. which you might be familiar with. Ken Ham would be an excellent person to talk to sometime if uh-huh. you have the opportunity. And so all the evidence of evolution is what? Well, there is no evidence of macroevolution. Uh-huh. I, will, I would not argue microevolution, nor would any other creationist. But uh, there is no evidence of macroevolution. That's where we have a contention. Um, well, despite that lack of evidence, uh, if I can see that point, that still doesn't mean that the the larger evolution that science talks of is not real. Well, if you remove macroevolution... Then you take then it all away? Then, then you remove the uh, evolution of man. Oh, boy, do we need more time. Um, Father, I'm sorry, we're out of time. Um, we are going to look into your computer problems, or you are, um, or he will, um, and then we'll we'll do this again. I guarantee. Father, thank you. God bless. Good night. Good night. <sighs> not enough. Not enough time. Absolutely fascinating topics. No question about that. From the high desert and the great American Southwest. 
Sorry we don't have more time. And uh, across all the time zones of the world, good night. Will we make it to tomorrow? Will the sun shine on you?